Hello and thanks for joining us. It's Friday the 2nd of May. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast here on Arirang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Investigators probing the capsize of the Sewolho ferry focus on the overloading of cargo and illegal renovations. The confirmed death toll has risen to 226, but 76 people remain unaccounted for. U.S. President Barack Obama is expected to name Mark Lippert a close advisor and friend as the next U.S. ambassador to Seoul, replacing Sung Kim as America's top diplomat in South Korea. Plus, April was another solid month for Korean exporters. The nation's trade balance has now been in the black every month for well over two years. We start with the latest on the Sewol Ho ferry disaster. It was another long and difficult night for the search and rescue teams at the accident site. The confirmed death toll now stands at 226, with 76 people, mostly teenagers, still unaccounted for some two and a half weeks after the disaster. For the latest on the search operation and the ongoing criminal investigations, our Kim Hyun Bin joins us in the news center. Hyun Bin. Hey, Mark, uh, the number of passengers confirmed dead continues to creep up slowly, with five additional bodies recovered this morning. The bodies of three male students were found in the lobby area on the fourth floor, and one passenger was found on the third floor lobby. One female student was found four kilometers southeast of the accident site. Officials had been hoping to speed up operations, but rapid tidal currents and bad weather, as well as debris and poor visibility, hampered the divers in their search. Divers are currently searching open cabins, but there are plans to forcibly open block sections using special equipment from the Navy and firefighters from this Sunday. The block sections are where many of the passengers still missing are believed to be trapped. To speed up the search, officials tried again to dispatch a diving bell to help divers stay underwater for longer, but it was withdrawn, proving ineffective against the notoriously rapid currents around the accident site. Yeah, they've had nothing but problems with that diving bell, it seems, unfortunately. But uh, Hyunbin, give us an update on the ongoing investigation into this tragedy. We hear prosecutors and police have requested arrest warrants against two officials from the ferry operator. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, the authorities are seeking to arrest two officials from the Cheonghaejin Marine Company on charges of manslaughter. Uh, investigators are looking into the possibility that overloading and illegal renovation of the vessel may have played a role in this capsize, and the two officials played a key role in these factors. Investigators think containers loaded on the ferry were only tied down with rope, which caused the cargo to slide when the ship lost balance. Okay, so more developments on that front, and investigators are also going after the owners of the ferry company and his closest associates. Yes, more than 10 locations linked to Yun byung -on, the owner of Cheonghaejin Marine Company, have been raided. The homes of Pyeong gi chun and Hwang ho eun who ran the company, were searched. Uh, prosecutors are also continuing to pile the pressure on Yu's closest associates. Uh, Yu, uh, Yu's son, Yu hyuk gi and Hangul Pharma chief, Kim Hye-kyung, have been summoned for questioning today. Uh, but the younger Yu is unlikely to meet the deadline as he is in the United States. Uh, the prosecution also applied for arrest warrants for Song Guk Bin, chief of the Tapada company, which is also owned by Yu. The prosecution suspects Song was deeply involved in the embezzlement of hundreds of thousands of dollars in irregular transactions involving the Yu family. Well, this has been Kim Hyun Bin. I'll be back at noon Korea time with more updates on the ferry disaster and the ongoings. Okay, thank you very much for your report there, Hyun Bin. Now, the unbearable wait for the families of the missing continues on Jindo Island near the site of the accident. And now a group of people who have gone through a similar awful experience are now with them and they're showing their support. Guan Sua reports. A group who knows as well as anyone the pain of having lost a family member in a ship disaster arrived on Jindu Island Wednesday afternoon to help the people who continued to wait for word of their loved ones who were aboard the Sewolhu ferry. The new group of volunteers is made up of family members of the victims who lost their lives when the South Korean warship Cheonan sunk on March 26, 2010. 46 people tragically lost their lives that day. 
Around 30 of their family members went to Jindu to stay with the families at Pengmukang Harbor and Jindu Indoor Auditorium. The people there waiting for word on the missing have been there for more than two weeks now and don't have much physical or mental strength left. The family members of the Tonan victims said they want to pay back the help they received from other volunteers four years ago. They added that they are being careful not to draw attention to themselves, that they just want to provide help in any way they can. That includes doing the laundry, cleaning up and serving food, among other tasks. They have also expressed their sorrow and frustration about this Heolho tragedy. I would have never thought that so many young students would die. And at this moment, I'm just sad. Why do these tragic incidents keep occurring? I hope this kind of tragedy never happens again. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And in the wake of the disaster, the Korean government says it's investing more and establishing a more centralized disaster response system and boosting emergency training. President Park Geun-hye asked all ministries to make sure manuals that contain emergency response procedures are in place and those in charge are well informed and properly trained. She also talked about maintaining the country's financial soundness through so-called pay-go policy so that expenditures are paid for with funds that are already available. Now, Mark Lippert, one of U.S. President Barack Obama's closest aides, has been chosen to be Washington's next ambassador to Seoul. Multiple diplomatic sources say the U.S. government notified South Korea during President Obama's visit to Seoul late last week. Lippert, who is currently Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel's chief of staff, served as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs from April 2012 till May 2013. He was also the former Chief of Staff for the U.S. National Security Council. The current Ambassador, Song Kim, seen there with President Obama, is expected to return to the State Department in September. There's a new player in the North Korean elite, and he's moving up the ranks extremely fast. It looks like Hwang byung so who was made a vice marshal just two weeks ago, has replaced another top-ranking official to become number two in the regime. Hwang sang -hee has this report. When North Korean leader Kim Jong-un visited a newly built textile mill in Pyongyang on Wednesday, he was accompanied by Hwang byung -so. Here, Kim ordered the military Politburo chief to congratulate the workers in celebration of May Day. Leader Kim called for May Day to be celebrated on a grand scale and ordered the military Politburo chief to attend the event to congratulate the workers. But Choi ryong hae a long-serving hardliner in the North Korea military brass, is not seen in the photos from that day. He is also absent from the list of officials who accompanied the young leader. The leader was accompanied by comrades Hwang byung so Park yong sik and Ma Won-chun. This has fueled speculation that Huang may have replaced Che as the military Politburo chief. North Korea watchers are keeping a close eye on the rapid rise of Huang, who was promoted to the position of vice marshal less than two weeks after being put in the ranks of a four-star general. Huang reportedly led last year's purge of Chang Sung Tech, who was once the second most powerful man in North Korea. Experts say Huang's speedy promotion may be intended to cap the power of Che, the regime's current number two. As for Che, who has vanished from public sight in recent weeks, the rumors are that he has been hospitalized due to complications from diabetes and fatigue. Huang sang Arirang News. China and Russia have confirmed that they will hold joint military drills at the end of this month. The exercise will, will take place in a very sensitive region of the East China Sea, where territorial disputes rage on. Our Connie Lee reports. Amid regional tensions, China and Russia are set to hold joint military drills at the end of the month. The naval drills, called the Jointly at Sea 2014, are planned for the East China Sea, where territorial disputes and differences over air defense zones are numerous. The East China Sea is where Beijing has had a long-standing dispute with Tokyo over islands called Diaoyu in China and Senkaku in Japan.
China also declared an air defense identification zone in that area last November and has called for all foreign aircraft flying through the area to identify themselves. It's a request both the U.S. and Japan have denounced and ignored. In a statement on its website, China's defense ministry said the drills were a regular exercise between the Chinese and Russian navies. They say the drills are intended to deepen their practical cooperation and enhance their ability to deal with maritime security threats. Analysts say that choosing the East China Sea as a location for the drills is an obvious political statement, with Washington as the audience. The U.S. has sided with Japan and the Philippines in their territorial disputes with China in the East and South China Seas. As for Russia, analysts say that joint drills could be interpreted as a protest against U.S. sanctions on Moscow that have been imposed over its actions in Ukraine. However, China's defense ministry described the upcoming drills as regular in nature and that similar drills with Russia were held in the past. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now back here in Korea and with a little over one month remaining before the June 4th local elections, the nation's political parties are busy finalizing their list of men and women they want to put forward as candidates. While many races remain up in the air, some have already taken shape. Our Shin Se-min has this report. Gearing up for the June 4th local elections, the ruling Senori Party and the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy have begun pinning down their candidates. The ruling and the main opposition parties have already confirmed candidates for the majority of the 17 mayoral and provincial governor seats up for grabs, and a number of the races crystallized on Wednesday and Thursday. Among those regions, the city of Busan, the nation's second largest city, will have a three-way competition as a former minister of fisheries, independent Olga Don, jumped into the race. He'll face off against Cha byung soo of the ruling Senuri Party and Kim young chun of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy. And over in Chungcheongnam-do province, the race between former veteran lawmaker Chung jin Seok of ruling Senuri Party and the current provincial governor An hee jung of the main opposition New Politics Alliance has been finalized. With the capsizing of the ferry hitting the nation at heart and with the growing distrust of the government and the ruling Senuri Party, the ruling party candidates are expected to be facing an uphill battle in the June 4th election. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Turning to some economic news now, and April was another sturdy, solid month for Korean exporters. The trade balance has now been in the black for 27 straight months. And on top of that, sectors that didn't fare so well last year are bouncing back extremely strongly. Song ji Son reports. Korea posted a 27th consecutive monthly trade surplus in April and more importantly, it resulted from improvement in most export industries. With the exception of LCD panels, key export items demonstrated strong growth, even steel and petroleum products, which suffered from a slump last year. Deliveries of high-value-added vessels, like drill ships, helped place the shipping industry at the top in terms of export growth. Traditional export engines like semiconductors and handsets also saw an expansion thanks in part to the launch of Samsung's new Galaxy S5 model. The nation's trade surplus stood at 4.5 billion U.S. dollars in April, with outbound shipments surpassing the $50 billion mark for the second time in history. Last month's export figure of $50.3 billion is up 9 percent from the same month last year, while imports rose 5 percent to $45.9 billion. By region, exports to U.S. rose 19 percent in April, another sign that the U.S. economy is recovering at a robust pace. Outbound shipments to ASEAN countries and Japan also gained ground, but slowed to European nations and China. Trade officials said, however, the large surplus in April was partly because exporters expedited shipping and customs clearances in April before the holidays in the first week of May. Looking to the month ahead, Slower growth is possible due to a fewer number of working days. Song ji Arirang News.
Time now for a look through our international headlines. For that, we connect live, as always, to our Eunice Kim, who's standing by at the news centre. Very good morning to you, Eunice. Now, authorities in China are now saying that religious extremists were behind the deadly explosion at a train station in the northwest of the country. That's right, Mark. The Chinese government is saying that that terror attack in Urumqi was carried out by at least two suspects with a history of, in religious extremism. It said that both people suspected to have struck bystanders with knives before detonating those explosives died in the explosion, taking with them one other person. Seventy-nine others were wounded. In reaction, Chinese President Xi Jinping called for a decisive action and said the government must prepare itself for a, quote, long-term, complex and acute fight against Xinjiang separatists. He was concluding a 40 tour of the Uyghur autonomous region when that attack took place. Wednesday's onslaught was the third high-profile attack against civilians in seven months, blamed on Xinjiang extremists. And at least 33 people have been killed in an airstrike over the largest Syrian city of Aleppo Thursday. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said government warplanes dropped missiles over a busy market in the rebel-controlled district. It follows a bombing over a school in southern Aleppo that killed 18 people a day before. Criticism continues to mount against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, who is preparing to be re-elected in a June poll as his government continues to attack rebel-held parts of Aleppo. More than 150,000 people have died in the three years of conflict against the Assad regime. Meanwhile, tensions in Ukraine is only heating up. Ukraine's acting president, Oleksandr Turchinov, has reinstated military conscription as Kiev continues to lose its grip on its eastern region. Pro-Russian militants took the regional prosecutor's office in the flashpoint city of Donetsk Thursday. This as NATO is boosting its presence in the region. A formal rotation ceremony was held on Wednesday in Lithuania, swapping out U.S. air contingents for NATO forces in the Baltic air policing mission. Meanwhile, Russian news agency RIA Novosti reports that Moscow began, began air force drills Thursday near its border with Estonia and Latvia. Together with Lithuania, the three Baltic states were under Soviet occupation for 50 years before they joined NATO and the EU. And this was not the kind of closure they were asking for. Families of the missing Flight 370 were informed on Thursday by Malaysia Airlines that the support center for relatives based at Beijing's Lido Hotel would close on this Friday. Malaysia Airlines said other support centers would close next Wednesday, explaining that the move was meant to encourage relatives to receive updates from the comfort of their own homes. Families, however, were visibly distraught, as you saw there. More than 100 of the 239 passengers on board that flight were from China. Meanwhile, Malaysian authorities have released a preliminary report on its investigation of the missing plane. The five-page report said related personnel only noticed the flight had disappeared from radar 17 minutes after the fact and did not activate an official rescue until four hours later. And good morning to you all as we kick things off with the 2018 PyeongChang Winter Olympics, which is still about four years away. And after the IOC's organizing committee held their three-day meeting, they liked what they saw. With the IOC members taking a look at how the preparation is being done for the 2018 PyeongChang Winter Games during their third meeting so far, they liked what they saw as Gunilla Lundberg, one of the VPs of the IOC, stated that she's sure it'll be a success. But she did add that there are still room for improvements as she stated that some of the venues, marketing, event service and test venues could use a little more improvement. And now moving over to the LPGA where the North Texas LPGA shootout just kicked off their four-day event. And with Pagan B claiming the title last season, she hopes to defend that title. And with 17-year-old Lydia Ko not participating in the event, all eyes will be on number one ranked Pagan B, who hopes to defend her title and win her first title of the season as well. 
Park, who started off the season slow, is quickly improving each week as she hopes to continue her recent success with her putting game. Meanwhile, with the Sarah Hall Memorial Altar being set up in Dallas, Park Seri and Lee Ji Young was seen at the altar paying respect to the victims before the event kicked off. And moving over to the KBO, where blown calls have been a center of a huge controversy during the past week, but things are really getting serious after one fan attacked an umpire on Wednesday night. Now, during Wednesday night's Kia SK game, after what looked to be yet another blown call, an intoxicated Kia fan ran onto the field and attacked the first base umpire. And while he was placed under police custody, the Kia Tigers have also banned him for life in all Kia home games. Meanwhile, the team added that all alcoholic beverages with 6% or more in alcohol content will not be sold as well. And now with that statement, the KBO, let's take a look at Thursday night's KBO action. The Kia Tigers get revenge thanks to SK's new KBO record of eight errors by beating them 20-2. With the NC Dinos beating the LG Twins 10-5 and the Nexon Heroes hang on to beat the Tucson Bears 2-1. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the Lotte Giants take on the Hanwha Eagles. Of course, going into the game here, first inning, Kim Tae Gyun an RBI double to center field and the Hanwha Eagles take a 1-0 lead. Before Felix P.A. grounds one to second base, this one an RBI ground out, giving the Hanwha Eagles the early 2-0 lead. Meanwhile, Hanwha's Yu Chang Shik with yet another shutout performance during five innings of no-run ball while giving up just four hits. Meanwhile, ninth inning of the game, men on first and second, Park Chung Yoon drives this ball to deep left center field. Ko Dong Jin makes the catch and the throw to first is in time double play. The Hanwha Eagles win this one 3-0. And now finishing things off with the ongoing incident with Donald Sterling, who has been given a lifetime ban in the sport. With the NBA owners set to vote on Donald Sterling to sell the team, the fans are getting involved as well. And one of the fans who helped set up the website, Drew Cohen, stated that given Mr. Sterling's past discriminatory actions and his most recent Highness comments, they have set up a letter writing campaign that allows fans to email owners directly to urge them to follow the commissioner's recommendation to exercise their authorities as owners to force the sale of the Clippers. And the fans who plan to get involved can email the owners of their favorite teams. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great weekend, everyone, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Strong currents in Jindo should start to ease up a bit as the spring ties end today. But the waves and winds should be a bit tougher today compared to yesterday. Also, thick fogs have been hovering over the excellent site since this morning. But the rest of the country is having mostly sunny day, but the clouds should increase as we head into the afternoon. And scattered sprinkles are in the picture for the Seoul metro area in the mid-afternoon, while the southern provinces will have temperatures hovering mid to upper 20s, so it should feel hot in the afternoon. Well, long weekend starts tomorrow. Next Monday is Children's Day and Tuesday is Buddha's birthday. And as for the weather condition here in the capital, temperatures should remain on the seasonal averages with a good amount of sunshine, but there could be sporadic showers on Sunday afternoon. So please do keep that in mind and let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The afternoon high in Seoul will rise to 22, Daegu will soar to 29, while Gwangju and Busan should pick 25 and 24 respectively. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like down on Jeju will reach 25, Daejeon peaks at 26, while Mount Kungang tops out at 21. Well that's all for now, but I'll be back with more updates after noon.
And that's all for now. We'll be back at noon Korea time. Until then, goodbye.